So, Mark Sherman, thank you very much for talking with me. I thought you have an unusual talent in terms of my other experts. So why don't we start with a song? Okay, thank you very much, Gail. Um, yeah, I, I wrote a lot of songs in the uh, 1970s, particularly a lot of them were humorous. And back then, uh, for a total of 25 years, I was a college teacher. So this song, uh, I never liked giving grades. I loved teaching. Grading was the thing I, I particularly did not care for. And in those days, at least, I don't know about now, uh, students would often, if they got a poor grade, they would uh, try to explain why and bargain with you. And so this song uh, was based, I made light of an experience that I didn't particularly love. And I call this, Please Professor. Please, Professor, give me a B. Wait. Sorry. Please, Professor, give me a B. I really understood your course, and I don't want to D. You tell me with what I know, I shouldn't even pass. Give me a B. Professor, or I'll knock you on your ass. I know I missed the first exam. You know my car was stuck, you see. How could I take the second one when my dog had BD? All right, I blew the final, but you know that could happen to you. Don't just look at that last exam, but hey, what about the other two? You know, I really love the psychology. I want to make it my profession. I want to save the world at only a hundred bucks a session. I want to go to graduate school and get a PhD. But I won't get to do that unless you give me that B. All right, I guess I give up. I see you won't change the grade. Up until I took your course, I thought I had it made. There's one thing you could do to ease my situation. Would you mind filling out this recommendation? <laughs> Give me a B, Professor, if you please. Because my transcript is coming with C's and D's. You know my parents, they keep asking, what'll become of me if you don't come across with that B? I can are. really identify with that. That was that was amazingly funny. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me put the guitar away here. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I just want to say because I don't play so much lately, and I screwed up a little in the beginning, <laughs> which I feel bad about. You know, musicians, you always want to have it be perfect. Um, but I do want to say for for viewers that um, I have um, there's I've done some YouTube videos, and there was one some years back, directed by a wonderful young woman named Allison Ferrara. And if people can find it, all you have to do is Google, please professor official music video. That's it. And you'll see. And that I recorded with a couple of terrific musicians back in 1977. So that's, those are the old days. And I do a little cameo appearance as the professor in the video. I'm not the young guy, but <laughs> anyway, so thank you so much for letting me do that. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was terrific. Um, how, how many times did you get that, please, professor, give me a better grade than I deserve request? I probably more than I'd like to count. Although I think I was a pretty reasonable grader. I really, um, I don't think I was, I didn't give A's that weren't deserved, but I gave students plenty of opportunities and I hated to ever give anyone an F. My feeling was if you're heading toward an F, why don't you just withdraw? But the whole thing bothered me, uh, Gail, and part of it was I realized um, most of my students were young people. There's some returning students who often did great, by the way. I, yeah. I'm sure you know, you realize people coming back and a lot of them were women who had, had been um, doing other things and they come back and they were fantastic. They're motivated. And some of my young students, a lot of them were excellent too. But the thing is that um, the, uh, I, again, I, I just, the whole thing about grading, it really bothered me 
so much. And I, oh, I remember what I was just going to say. Young people, I knew, they often had real problems in their lives. There were people whose divorces were quite frequent. This was in the 70s. And um, I knew they were struggling. And so their grades, as far as I was concerned, probably were as much a reflection of their personal lives for some of them as it was how well they were studying. And so I always felt kind of bad because they were suffering. And yet I had a grade. I felt I had to be fair. It had to be based on as objective data as I could get, because otherwise it would be one story versus another. But I got through it, and and humor has always helped me a lot, getting through everything. <laughs> right. So. Well, let's start at your very beginnings. Where and when were you born? Okay. Am I in the screen okay? You're not chopping off too much of me? Um, you could tip it a little bit so we see more head and less chest. All right. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Better? Okay, good. Yeah, I was born... Um, December 2nd, 1942, and I was born in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> so that makes you a Sagittarian, and they ask deep questions, are adventurous, free thinkers. I'm thinking that some of that applies to you. Well, adventurous, not physically. <laughs> I've never been particularly courageous when it comes to things like rock climbing, uh, things like that. But adventurous in terms of just, you know, being on the wild side for a little while, yes. <laughs> Again, keep in mind, I'm a child of the 60s and then the 70s. As far as free thinking, absolutely. And I'm a, a strong believer not only in people's thinking uh, outside the box and, and free, free speech. I'm a very much a believer in, in an openness to all kinds of ideas. And uh, so that's always, so that's absolutely true. Yes. No question. And then a little bit about your education, trajectory, career path. Why did you decide to go into psychology? Okay. I um, That's a good question, and I'll try not to go on too long with any of this. I mean, you're a great interviewer, and uh, it's so easy. Um, I, um, I really liked science and math a lot in uh, high school, even before high school, and uh, the Russians had launched... Uh, their satellite called Sputnik back in the, whenever it was, the 50s, I guess. And there was a lot of pressure. On those days, it was just on boys. You know, it was a different world then. Uh, you got to do science. But I like science and math. And so when I went to college, um, and I went to the University of Pennsylvania, it was a good, you know, a good private school. Um, and um, I like science and math. I also became a pre-med, not so much because I wanted to be a doctor, but my dad was a doctor. And he never directly said to me, I want you to go to medical school. But the message was very clear uh, without him having to say it. It was very obvious. And so I was a pre-med and I was a math major. And I loved applied math, but this was pure math. And I met my match by around my sophomore, junior year. And I was like, I can't do this. I mean, let me put it this way. You get grades mailed to you in a postcard or an envelope. And I always used the postcard, but for one this math course, I had an envelope so my parents wouldn't see the grade and was for the only time in my life, the only D I ever got, I was overjoyed to see a D because I thought I, I, I must have failed this course. And there was a message there. <laughs> math perhaps is not for you. <laughs> senior year, it's now senior year. What am I going to do? And fortunately, Penn had a major called natural sciences, which meant if you were taking physics and and biology and things like that, you could have that major. The only thing missing was uh, psychology. I mean, maybe there was some other thing. So I said, all right, I'm a freshman. I'm sorry, I'm a first semester senior. I was pretty young because I don't know if you know, but in New York City, they have something called SP where a lot of kids skipped a grade in junior high. So you went from seventh directly to ninth. This was about the top maybe quarter of the students. So I'm, I really was young already. I graduated from uh, I started college before I even turned 17, so I was still pretty young. And here I am as a senior. I go in, I take a psych course, general psych, big lecture room, big lots of students, with a teacher named Henry Gleitman, G-L-E-I-T-M-A-N, great teacher, subsequently deceased. I mean, he's, he's this was a long time ago. He was just a great teacher. So here's this great teacher, and I thought, I really like this stuff. And on top of it, I was doing well in it. <laughs> pretty easily when, you know, that's a good combination. You like it, you're doing well in it. And I thought, you know, I think maybe I should go into this. Fortunately, unlike things like math, 
to get into graduate school, you didn't really need to be a psych major. You needed general psych, you needed experimental psych, you needed statistics for the typical grad school. I didn't go to clinical graduate school. I was going to go to what turned out to be experimental psych. And so I took stat, I took uh, experimental the next semester. I did very well senior year. My grades had kind of shown a U curve. So by sophomore and junior year, I was at the bottom of the U. And, and there's a message, by the way, to students who may struggle sometimes, stay with it. Especially for, I say, especially for guys who don't mature as fast on the average as women. And so they may struggle at a certain age and then they're gonna come through it many times and do better. And I did. Senior year, so I take these courses, I'm doing well. And I figured I wanna to go to graduate school. And, and I applied to Clark University in Worcester, good place, got in with a stipend. And I figured, well, you know, I did well. I did very well in GREs. And I said, maybe I'll apply to some really big places. So I applied, I think, to Cornell, Indiana, and Harvard. I got, I think, rejected by Cornell, which is a very good school. Indiana, I think, too. And to my amazement, like in the summer, I get this postcard from Harvard saying, are you coming? Are you? I said, am I coming? Have I been accepted? <laughs> and apparently things had like crossed in the mail. There was some screw up in the post office. They sent me an acceptance letter and I hadn't seen it. So I felt bad because I told Clark I was coming. They were very happy to be having me. And I remember I had a job in the summer working in a sort of a psychology lab. And I asked a graduate student, I said, what do you think? He said, are you kidding? B.F. Skinner's at Harvard. <laughs> So I went to Harvard. My brother was already an undergraduate there. So there was my brother. Um, and that's that's my story. <laughs> Why did they select you if you had that uneven GPA? How did you okay. get into Harvard? I think it was two things. I think it was that I did do very well senior year. My performance in the psych courses I did take was very good. And I probably got really good recommendations. And I think... At least one of the professors there, I think, took very seriously these kind of aptitude tests. And in my case, the graduate record exam, I had a really high score. And so I think maybe that professor particularly must have said, you know, this guy looks like he's got some potential. Let's let's take him. And fortunately, he wasn't the only guy making the decision. But um, so I think that's what it was. And I got there and it was like, first of all, I was very excited. But I'm, you know, 20 years old. I'm. Uh, it was a small program. There are only seven other students in the experimental psych program, and I realized I was now meeting my match. This was, <laughs> this was very much the big leagues, and and I had a, I had. It was going to take, uh, but you know, challenges. I think are great for us. And so, I think we what do ourselves a disservice if we don't take challenges? Yes. What did you focus on? Like in your dissertation and that kind of thing, what, what experimental work did you do? Okay, my first interest was, I just want to, I'm sorry, I keep worrying about the phone. I'm I think that's <laughs> mine. I thought I had plugged it. Let me go unplug it, excuse me. Okay. Oh, it's the other one. Sorry, I thought I unplugged them all, but I no, didn't. I love the informality. I unplugged. I didn't unplug them all, but my wife, when she's out, I always if she had to get me. I'd like to be able to know that, you know. Um, but anyway, although it's doubtful, she will. Um, I um, my interest became. I wasn't sure what to do, but by the third year, I had finished up my uh, most of my coursework. I had taken my comprehensive exams, and I became interested in something called psycholinguistics or psychology of language. I just was very intrigued by it. And um, so that's what I did my thesis on. And it was about um, how we comprehend sentences and, and what's going on in sentence comprehension. Um, my thesis advisor was a very eminent psychologist named George Miller, who uh, had been, became president of the American Psychological Association right around the time I was finishing up my, my graduate uh, program. Uh, he was, he was a, uh, Formidable guy, but really, really quite the reputation. And he was my advisor, and um, it was hard work. And and um, 
It was really about how we comprehend negatives in sentences, which sounds kind of abstruse. But strangely enough, when I Google at Google Scholar, people use the research because it was sentences that had more than one negative in them. And then, of course, people who are into legal stuff are curious about the way things are worded. So, you know, you never know when you do your work. And I published a couple of papers based on it. You never know who's going to wind up using it. But I taught a course at the college I taught for 25 years called Psychology of Language. I introduced it. It wasn't on the books until I came along. And I was happy to learn that as recently as a couple of years ago, when I retired in 1995, I was pretty young and I retired, it's still being taught. So the idea that I developed a course that these younger people have come along and teach makes me feel very good. And then how did that lead to your interest in gender? Another, you know, I, I think... I really believe a lot of what we do is based on somewhat chance types of things, to be honest with you. Hmm. I really think so. Sometimes big decisions. And here's what happened. It was very interesting. <laughs> I was always kind of interested. I mean, as a, as a heterosexual guy, I was interested in girls, but I was also curious about their lives, about the way they talked. Just kind of curious. But again, I'm young. I just wondered. And you just had I, one brother and that was the only sibling? One, well, yes, one brother. No sisters, um, it was, which is interesting related to later research I did after the first thing I did. I remember this. This was, um, I remember the, essentially the date, not the exact date. It was, I think, October of 1976. And I'm in the hallway talking to a friend in the department. We weren't actually that close friends at that point. But we, you know, we knew each other and we respected each other. And this was we at Harvard. Really Pardon? This was at Harvard. No, this was at, at, at SUNY New Paltz where I taught. In other words, I was not, gender was not my particular interest in terms of research at Harvard. It was when I got into SUNY New Paltz, and even there, for the first few, several years, I wasn't, that wasn't my specialty at all. I taught experimental psych, I taught statistics, um, I taught general psych, uh, I taught behavior modification, which I was also, I really liked. I had taken a course with B.F. Skinner my first year in grad school. I thought that work was great. Um, so, but then I'm in the hall with a, with a colleague and we were just kind of joking about research and he said something like, well, suppose we made the thesis that what happens after you have sex, after orgasm, um, is more important than the orgasm itself or something like that. And we both kind of laughed because it's that's ridiculous. But then, as often happens, <laughs> We're standing there and we thought, has anyone really studied what happens after people have sex, like they're done and, and you know, and the way things are? Unfortunately, sometimes the guy's done, the woman isn't yet, but this done is done. And we said, hmm, has anyone studied this? And we looked around we, and nobody had. Um, there was a word after play barely used, but we figured, hmm, you know, that might be a good title. We had no idea we'd be doing a full book on this at this point. And we did a pilot study. And what we discovered, and I think this is very important, is that while men weren't particularly aware that that was important, in other words, what happened afterwards, some of them just went to sleep. Not all of them. That was kind of a stereotype, it turned out. By far not all of them. Women felt it was very important that it was not just the sex, how they were treated in bed afterwards, the guy who just got up and left, the guy who says something stupid. This this was not good. So we thought, wow, there's really something here. And so, again, to not go through the whole thing, we wrote a book proposal, and my colleague, much more adventurous, calling people he didn't <laughs> we didn't know, gets on the phone with someone who was the publicity agent for Sherry Height, who had done a best-selling book called The Height Report. He called up and he said, you know, a colleague of mine, I worked on a book. We think you might be interested. She said, what's the name of it? He said, oh, he said, I can't tell you that. It's, he just, <laughs> he got her so interested. <laughs> so we sent in a proposal. This was early 1978. They liked it immediately. I think they particularly liked the title. And we came down to uh, New York City, to UN Plaza at this very nice office. And she said, she loved it. She said, I can get you such and such an advance, which back in those days would be equivalent to quite a nice amount today. It was very nice. We heard money that it wasn't like huge by today's, but it was, it was nice. And um, she 
got us a publisher, uh, Stein and Day. Uh, and we had a deadline that was so hard to meet because it was such a rush deadline, but we did the work. We did the research with anonymous questionnaires, with interviews, and the book, uh, we finished it. And it came out in, um, I think, August of 1979. And who were your subjects? Were they, I mean, ordinarily they're college students, but there's... They were a variety. We, what we did is we sent questionnaires to friends of ours in different parts of the country and said, totally anonymous, just give them to people, have them mail them back, complete anonymity, and we had a variety. It wasn't just college students. I think our sample was really very largely heterosexual. I mean, I think that's, you know, that was a different time when not as people weren't coming out quite as readily. Um, I think there's been a real progress in our country. Um, but it was a, a fairly decent age range. I think maybe more students, but we didn't just, we didn't do it so much locally because we really, in a sense, wanted it to be anonymous. Um, we had some interviews. Um, and so we had a variety of occupations, and um, we called the book After Play, A Key to Intimacy. And um, we, no, it, it, it sold okay. Um, the paperback came out two years later. Uh, lots of articles about it. Yes. What did you say beside the obvious that women want to be, you know, cuddle and pillow talk a little bit. What what else is there to say in a book? Well, it wasn't so obvious then. You know, we didn't know. In fact, men, men, I think, were, I can't, I hate to say it, kind of clueless. I don't want to put my gender down because I'm very pro-male. <laughs> As you know, I have kids, sons, grandsons. Um, but I do think that men weren't aware and that and that um, women, maybe now they are a little more, they weren't treating men the way they often were treated. In other words, women, the getting up and leaving right afterwards was something that men might do, women didn't. I, maybe that's changing. I mean, now they're, you know, friends with benefits. There's all this stuff that was not going on back in the day. Um, we found there were certain things, for example, people really didn't like. They did like the cuddling. They did like um, pillow talk. They liked, you know, affection to be expressed. They didn't like, you know, returning quickly to the discussion of mundane kinds of things. They didn't want to be interrogated. Women, uh, in terms of their own orgasms, some, I guess, were obvious, although women can can fake it. I'm not saying they do, but some can. Oh, they do. I mean, Cher Height found that a lot of women faked it. Yes. And that's yes. what, 70% of women need direct clitoral stimulation. They don't oh, have yes. orgasm from vaginal penetration. Absolutely. But we found that women really didn't like it when a man would say, well, how was it for you? In other words, he might have this kind of subtle thing. They didn't like it. If sex was going to be discussed, not right then. And it turns out the way we ended up describing it uh, is that the period directly after intercourse is a very tender, can be a very tender period. And it's like a bubble. And if you say the wrong thing, if you screw up, you're bursting the bubble. It's not the end of the world, but that's it for that otherwise pleasant and very enjoyable time. And my colleague and I felt, we came from a slightly different perspective. I was more behavioral than him. He was more into depth psychology. And that was a good combination because uh, we didn't see things exactly the same way. But he felt, and I agreed, this was the time of, of sort of true intimacy. And that quite a few men, maybe still today, and again, this was quite a while back, we haven't done any follow-up, um, were kind of afraid of intimacy. Okay, I'll have, we'll have the sex, but I don't want to. I don't want to talk to you about love or anything like that, especially if it's a new relationship. Um, we also got rid of stereotypes. Uh, did some men fall asleep? Quite a few. Yes, not by any means all of them. Um, but when they did, it didn't make women terribly happy. <laughs> you think? Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it was. I think what we the main thing was. And we did a survey, of, and again, this, you know, correlation does not mean causation, and we know that. But it turns out that people, I think women particularly, but I forget, you know, there's a lot of data, and I, the book is quite a while ago, so I haven't just looked at it recently, that the quality of afterplay correlated pretty highly with, these, with how good the relationship was. Now, one could say, well, a good relationship, you're going to have good afterplay, but you might as well... Think of it the other way. There's nothing to lose. In other words, treat your partner nicely afterwards. The worst that can happen is maybe you won't have a great relationship, but at least 
you're doing something that could strengthen the relationship. You know what's interesting to me is studies show a lot that men who do more housework, family work, have more sex. That's interesting. That could be. That I'm not aware of. But oh, yeah. But that, by because the way, that's the, not if bad. if the woman's resentful, you know, I have to do all the work and you're sitting there watching TV sports, I'm not, that she don't want to have sex with him. So I, I wonder what else, what did you find in terms of gender differences besides it, maybe it's more important for women to have the cuddling afterwards? You know, it's hard to remember right now. Again, that's so long ago. I know. I'm involved so much in other stuff. Right. But, I, you know, um, the, the, there were those differences, but I, I, it was just, I think what it was, here, I think the main thing is what we found, I don't know if there's anything abs distinctly counterintuitive that we found. There wasn't anything dramatic except for how important this was, mm. at least back then mm. in terms of ratings, orgasm, very important. But for women, what happened afterwards for many of them was, was just as important because not all women had orgasms. And by the way, one of the reasons they hated when men asked is because some women who aren't faking it, it's still very dramatic. There's, there's a lot of they, they're yelling there. Other women, it's more subtle, but they still have that. They still have an orgasm. And so they don't like to be quizzed on it. Um, man is a little more clearly dramatic, though men theoretically can fake it too. That, um, you know, I'm not sure how that, <laughs> how guys do that. But <laughs> anyway, um, the, the, but it was just something, and I think this was really important, something that was so important to women, really, but it, no, no women had actually done this work. And I really do think sometimes an outsider can, can give you more information about your own group than people within the group. It's like if you want to ask about water, don't ask a fish. <laughs> I've heard that. In other words, we as a couple of men, the fact that at first it was like, oh, this is ridiculous. That's not so important. And then we thought, wait a second. It is. That's because we didn't have that experience that women often were having. So I found that very, um, that was really quite, I almost felt like we were gender anthropologists, so to speak. We were in this different world um, and, and it, was, it was a good experience. What, roughly what percent of the women admitted faking orgasms? That I don't, I don't think we asked that question. Ah, uh, that would have been interesting. No, that would be an interesting question. I don't think that was one we asked. But we also asked, you know, what do you like? What do you not like? And that's what we found the thing about mundane activities. Uh, women particularly didn't like when the guy jumped up out of bed really quickly. Um, didn't like a comparison with other partners, even if favorable. In other words, if a guy said, God, you're unbelievable. You're the best I've ever had. It's like, oh, okay, suddenly there's another woman there. Women did not like that. And that was interesting, too, because the guy think, oh, yeah, that's a nice thing to say. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't. You, you also did um, research on women talking to women and men talking to men, which I thought was interesting because it predated Deborah Tannen's work that everybody knows about by about six years. It so did. That, it took me, I don't know how many decades <laughs> to even begin to get over that. What oh. happened with that? <laughs> Yeah, I worked with a colleague, and again, how ideas come along is very interesting. You know, one of the depressing things about creative ideas is it's very hard to manufacture them. They just happen. If they just happen, and I still remember this too, After Play was now done. I think it was maybe it had just been published or was about to be published, and I was already wanting to go on to something else. And I remember having lunch with a young woman who was a graduate student in, in, in the department. I think she had graduated, I believe, from Smith College. And she said, um, she said something about what women talk about. Just at lunch. I said, women talk about that? She said, yeah. And I suddenly realized, I have no idea what women talk about. I have no idea what women's conversations are like. I have no sisters. I, I when I was growing up, I hung out with boys, as a lot of boys did and probably still do. I just was not privy to these conversations women had with each other. And a lot of women, maybe most or certainly many, were not privy to conversations men had with men. Uh, and so I got together with a colleague who was in the communications department named Adelaide Haas. 
who I liked a lot. We were friends anyway. And she had done some work with kids on boys talking to boys and girls talking to boys. So she was an ideal person to work with. And we did research, questionnaires, interviews. And we asked about same-sex conversations. And we asked a bunch of things. We asked about topics. We asked about what do you like most about them. And we found out a lot of stuff. And she published a couple of things in academic presses, in academic journals. And her name was first, mine was second, because it was her, she sent it in. And I wanted you know, a, to get out there in the world more. And so I wrote a proposal to Psychology Today, which was a big deal magazine at the time. It still is, but now it's online a lot too. So this was 19, around 19, early 1980s, I guess. And I wrote to them and an editor said they were very interested in this. Could I write something? And quickly. And I did. And I sent it in to site today. It was called Man to Man, Woman to Woman. Um, and it got quite a bit of attention. It was uh, mentioned in an article in, in uh, I think, Time Magazine, Time or News. I think it was Time Magazine. And that was kind of exciting. Uh, it got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of kind of press. And what the main, one of the main findings was a different style so that men with each other were very into problem solving. If a man had a problem hmm. and mentioned it to another man, he said, well, here's what you do. And sometimes they'd offer it even if the man didn't ask. Like I remember riding a bike and some guy who was more of a bicyclist than me said something like, you know, your seat's too low. You should put your seat higher. In other words, okay, women were more likely to enjoy the empathy of conversations. They really liked when a woman said something about what's happening at work, the friend would empathize and say, well, what's that been like for you? Or, or again, I wasn't, I wasn't in women to women conversations, but this is what I observed. And by the way, I started listening in. There's no law against it. If you're at a restaurant and there's a couple of women in the booth behind me, I'm not recording them. I'm listening and I'm not, that you're allowed. Um, I also started reading women's magazines. I found everything I could to tell me about what women were talking about with each other and how they were talking about it. And I asked questions and um, it was it was really something. And this different in style, by the way, and which was the main point of our article, was that when a woman hears, here's what you do, she might feel that the man doesn't think she's capable and that's why he's saying it. Whereas in reality, guys do that with each other. And it's an overgeneralization perhaps. And that, so I learned <laughs> about this so that when my wife, who was in a regular full-time job then for many years, would come home and talk about something involving work and how her boss was treating her. Ordinarily I'd say, well, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Instead I'd say, well, what specifically is it that she's doing that's bothering her? She'd talk, tell me, and I'd say, and I guess that makes you feel such and such. And say, yes. And I'd finish up and say, thank you. I really appreciate that. And my feeling was, what did I do? <laughs> but I got it. I got it. So we had that come out, and I was excited. I tried to get a book publisher. I uh, had an agent, tried to, could not get one. Wow. And after a while, Addie said, look, I've had enough with this. Why don't you just try to do it on your own? And I did. Nothing happened. And then 1990, I think it was, I see this book by Deborah Tannen called You Just Don't Understand. Right. And she, in fact, I looked at my book proposal. There's one little thing, because I had a book, book proposal on this, where I have a little um, dialogue between a man and a woman. And the man says something, the woman says something, and then she, the man says something else. And the woman says in my little dialogue, you just don't understand. And I saw agents, and I began to think maybe some agent told Deborah Tennant about it. I hate to go there. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. But it was very disconcerting. And what was particularly upsetting to me, I must say, is that Tannen, in her book, as I recall, never cited us. And it wasn't like we had kept our stuff private. We had published in a couple of regular academic journals and Psychology Today. That was a pretty big deal. And that had gotten quite a bit of attention. And maybe Google wasn't around yet, but there would have been ways, I think, to find that. And the fact that we weren't mentioned made me a little wondering 
about it. And it, it was upsetting because she had, it was a huge bestseller. And um, <laughs> what, what, what she that. said, and see if you found the same thing. She said, when women talk to each other, they tell secrets. And mm -hmm. when boys talk to each other, they're establishing dominance hierarchies and, and as you say, instruction. Did you find that too? We didn't so much talk about dominance and hierarchy or secrets, as I recall, but we did. It was a question of instruction rather than empathy. So that's similar to what you're saying. And in fact, I had a videotape, I mean, of Deborah Tennant on um, the, uh, what's his name, Char Charlie Rose's show before he became a persona non grata years ago, <laughs> this was. And I, I made a little transcript of this conversation. And what she says in there, I've got to say, Gail, was so much like what we had said in 1984. And it was so depressing. And again, not to accuse anyone of anything. Maybe it was just chance. But it's depressing when you have something which really had potential and, and nothing happened. And um, she went on to have this you know, great fame and have a major impact and, and it was a little it was distressing but it's no, you go I, on i know what you mean because my book 50 50 marriage was one of the first books about egalitarian marriages and i'll see books like 10 years later the first book about egalitarian marriage i'm like no <laughs> no it's upsetting it is upsetting and it's <laughs> we're not the only ones i mean i think uh you know hist historically there are people who have been the first um, and then, and it's not the time yet, or they're not in the right place at that moment. And someone else comes along and they're the ones who get the fame and the, and the money. And for me, I'll be honest with you, money has never been my goal in life. It's, we do fine. And I'm happy with that. And fame would be nice. But the main thing about getting another book out is that with, and a best selling book, let's say if it had become that, then there'd be immediate interest in my next one. In other words, once you, you're established like that, then you, when you send something to an agent, you are not in the slush pile. You are, oh, I'm certainly willing to look at it. It doesn't mean you'll do anything. I mean, there are people who have had a couple of great books. That's the end. But anyway, that was the most frustrating part. For me. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. Um, what, to update all this, what have you seen in terms of your six grandsons Five, your three, five. five grandsons. So you hear them talking. What? How has it changed since you wrote the, uh, the article for Psych Today? That's a good question. I, first of all, unfortunately, we don't. They don't live in the same town we do. Uh, the closest ones, the youngest, are about you know 160, 170 miles away. The uh, three oldest are in California, and I'm on the East Coast, so. It's a big trip. And of course, with COVID, it's been quite a while. Um, so I don't, there are two sets of brothers. My oldest is an only child. Uh, then he's cousins in California, the two brothers. And then in, in outside of Philadelphia, there's two brothers. Um, I don't have a chance so much to hear their interactions. And, and I haven't, you know, having done that work, I'm not, usually I'm onto new things. <laughs> and so I haven't paid that much attention. I don't know how much that's changed. I think I get the feeling that to a large degree, not every boy, but most boys hang out with other boys. Most girls hang out with other girls. Tomboys are a notable exception. I am very open, by the way. Um, this is not to be politically correct. I am very open to any boy or girl who doesn't fit into that mold. And there are boys who might be happier hanging out with girls. And I'm totally good with that. But I think from a statistical point of view, I bet you'd still find that boys, you know, going up until the middle teenage years are mostly hanging out with other boys. In fact, I know that for me, and I wonder if this is true, I'm thinking of one of my grandsons who's now 14, whether for me, I had to sort of learn how to talk to girls. It was like, oh, this is a whole new experience for me. So I think there's a comfort level for boys, which I suspect still still exists. But again, I haven't studied it. My, what I see is that when I grew up, boys had cooties, girls had cooties. They were, it was really pretty separate. It, it was unusual to have a, 
a best friend or friend who was the opposite sex. Yes. But that's yes. really changed. So they, they don't think in terms of gender or skin color or, any, you know, your different background. They're much more comfortable with diversity. And so I see that with my grandson, who's 10. That okay. They, they hang and out. Near, you see him pretty often, though. So you, you live nearby, right? Yeah. 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 I wish I could observe that the way, you, you know, I don't. I suspect, however, based on what I'm seeing, you are absolutely right. And I take that as a good thing. And I think... That because, you know, the generational changes have been rapid, everything's been rapid, technological change is unbelievable. Uh, and I think your point, your point is probably a very good one. And I think, oh, I'll give you an example. This is um, not exactly what you're saying. Um, one of my sons, um, my oldest, one of his friends growing up, and he didn't know until the guy told him when he was 16 or 17, is gay. And my son was kind of we wish the guy had told him earlier just because there's a close friend and how could you not share that with me turns out a close friend of mine from way back in the day was gay and now we're getting on zoom me and him and another guy we've been friends more than 60 years and and but in those you know back then you a lot of gay guy guys did not come out at all but anyway to get to the point my son's friend back east was getting married to his longtime partner and his son was going to go to the wedding and he was telling me about it. He says, well, I'm going to, I'm not going to name names, but the, you know, I'll say Joe and Larry, I'm going to Joe and Larry's wedding. Said it without even the slightest indication as if this is kind of different because in his world, it's not. Right. And I think that's all for the good. Yeah. No, you I, I think that's the difference with generations Y and Z. Yes. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And my generation, we were, we, we had our, we had our problems. <laughs> well, some people call it the greatest generation. But, um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, what I wanted to ask you about before we leave Harvard is you, you respected J.F. Skinner, but. B.F., B.F. But, but, but what I hear, you know, Skinner boxes and putting the baby in the box and not picking yeah. them up <clears throat> and <clears throat> really strict behavior mod techniques. The, what, why did you respect him so much and like him? All right. First of all, I think that's been very much um, mis, mis talked about in, in a way that's not correct. He, he um, actually, I don't know if she, he had two daughters. I don't know if this is the one who was raised in what he called in, I think he, I think he called it a baby chamber or something. He didn't call it a Skinner box. That was different. <laughs> that was for, really for pigeons and, and rats that he was doing behavioral studies with. I actually spoke in the last six months or so with one of his daughters. It was very, I was very excited to talk to her. She is now in her 80s. Um, Skinner died at 86 in uh, 1990, I think it was. Um, he just believed that a baby in that kind of a situation you could keep the temperature adjusted. Baby would could be in a diaper, but that was it. Didn't have to have any kind of bulky clothes on. And it was just very comfortable. And it, I'm sure he didn't just never have any interactions with the baby. And I think both his daughters, I think, have turned out fine. There was all these rumors. They're crazy. They're, there was some rumor. In fact, I, not my, I don't know if it was the one that I spoke to or her sister, was that they had she had killed herself. And, and, and it was like... Last time I saw her just earlier today, she was fine. So <laughs> I think he he was misjudged a lot because of that. I will say this. Um, I was in a small seminar with him. I was in over my head in a sense because I'm, a, I'm, I'm new to psychology really in a way. I've had a couple, few courses. I'm 20 years old. There were some really tough like graduate students in there, but there I am. And he, he, he's a genius. He, he, you know, he was a little odd as geniuses are, but it became evident to me right then that this guy was really something. And in the department, which had some real heavy hitters, he d had a respect that, I mean, he would walk into a room and even these other pretty eminent professors would definitely take notice. So even, even there, he kind of stood out. And the importance of reinforcement the importance of positive reinforcement, which is what he stressed so much, I think is so vital. I think, I think, um, 
you know, and, and, and limits on children trying to avoid punishment if you can. You know, there are things people do now which were, came out of his work, which was mostly with animals, but it was extended to people. There's stuff, people are doing things routinely now that when I first taught about this back in the 70s, people ha didn't even know what it was about. Something called time out. The punishment that he recommended wasn't anything harsh, but okay, you're going to stay there for the next five, 10 minutes, whatever it was, however the age of the child was. This is now routinely used. Yeah. Um, with my own children, with our own children, I very much try to use some of this. For example, he would say that if a child is throwing a tantrum, if you give into it, that'll mean the child's message is, oh, I can get what I want now by throwing a tantrum. So Shelly and I, our kids, as they will always try, would throw a tantrum. We would ignore it. I mean, we didn't ignore things where they were really troubled. And people could argue with me, oh, maybe there was something really. My thing was, no, they are learning. This is how I get what I want. But with us, they didn't learn that. And the tantrums stopped. However, we were very quick to reinforce when they did good stuff. We, were, we didn't ignore it. We said, oh, that's fantastic what you just did. Um, so I think that was a major contribution. Mm. I think that was so vital. And I think in management, in child rearing, in self-control, um, it, it, it works so well. And, and I think he, he made a major contribution. I mean, he, uh, he, you know, he wasn't talking about the inner self. He, 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 Freud was very much into the inner dynamic. But my feeling was, Freud and other depth psychologists, you're gonna learn a lot about yourself, but now you wanna change. You wanna do things differently because we can know we came from this difficult childhood, which finally people, every not everybody, but a lot of people have. Okay, now I've learned that, but now I'm struggling with this. What do I do so I do better? When I started using behavioral methods to study better, I just started doing way better. I had done okay in school, but sometimes not so well. But once I learned these techniques, it was like, hey, this really works. So that was what I think struck me about him. An example of that, I was studying for a comprehensive master's exam, and when I read a book, I'd write it on a shirt board, a cardboard, and mm -hmm. that simple thing of putting out a new book on my list on my little shirt board motivated me. Yes, yes, yes. And another thing, and I used to tell students this because I did something like coaching students who were having trouble with exams based on some of these principles. One of the things I think is the most vital, and I learned this, is if you're going to take an exam, the most, I think the most important thing you can do is what's called, I think it's called recitation. You try to, you, you have someone quiz you and see if, you know, because you know the kinds of questions that are coming and you answer them. And, and when I had my comprehensive exams, I knew the kinds of questions I'd be getting because I, you could see old exams. I studied hard all summer. The exams were in September. Before the exam, I would give myself sample questions. I would spend a half an hour writing the answer. A couple of those questions came out either the same or in a slightly different form on the new exam. But even if it didn't, I, had, I hadn't just this osmosis thing. You learn by osmosis. No, maybe but you actively do something that is going to stick with you. Right. And it that, worked really well. That, that's what worked for me, too, is to have uh, index cards with uh, information and then turn them over <clears throat> and ask myself questions about it, think about it. And I know at Berkeley, almost every test, I didn't have to think because I'd already prepared it and outlined it. And they would oh. ask that. You went to UC Berkeley? Yeah. Oh, great. That's great. I wonder if my, uh, any of my California grandsons would, you know, they're, they're one of them, they're, two of them are freshmen in high school now, so it's still a few years away, but uh, I wonder if any of them are going to uh, wind up there. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> oh, that would be great. Um, what got you involved in the men's movement? Because doing academic study of ling the ling linguistics of gender is much different than the men's movement and activism. Right. Okay. First of all, the word men's movement has a lot of <laughs> mixed messages. Sometimes it implies men who are, I hate to say it, but some are misogynists. I think that's an overstatement, but so I'm a little uncomfortable with some of that term. I'm, I, I am for 
men, and especially, by the way, for boys and young men, which is my my major interest. In other words, I really think if you mention the word men to a lot of women, sadly, and they've had a bad experience, they'll almost have a negative reaction just to the word. You mention the word boy, it's not the same. Boys are boys. And, and I have, you know, I have these little photographs sometimes in my PT pieces, I, I should, well, of, of grandsons that you can't see, you know, you can't, you don't see their whole face. And I cleared it with my son first. They're very cute. And these are, these are boys, but they're, they're so cute. And, and what happens to them, maybe some is biology, but some is culture or whatever it is. But my main thing was boys and young men. And so what happened with me, I mean, again, I remember this pretty distinctly. I had been very supportive of women. I had been, I probably call myself a feminist. I was supportive of women's studies in my college, which started one of the first women's studies programs, early seventies. I uh, was a, when I, my department started out all men when I got there in 1970, I was one of the few guys who said, you know, we got to, we got to get a woman. This is ridiculous. Then after a while it was half women at least. So I was pro women. I absolutely was. I loved it when my female students did well. I would do anything I could to get them into good graduate schools. And then, first of all, I had three sons. And then in 19, the early 1990s, when the youngest of my sons at this point was about, he was born in 81, so he was about 11, 12. I began to notice that boys were not doing so well in school, that girls were definitely doing better. And books were coming out, like it's a book by, um, I think David and Myra Sacker called Failing in Fairness, How America Schools Cheat Girls, or Cheating Girls. And he was giving a keynote speech at a conference on gender equity, probably around 1994. So I went to it. And I had data right in front of me about how boys were not doing so great. And so he gives his, he tells his thing, and he's talking about girls aren't being called on often enough, and they're, they're not being noticed, blah, blah, blah. So I raised my hand, and I said, you know, I understand what you're saying, but the data is indicating that it's the boys who are struggling more than the girls. He, I forget exactly his reaction, we're talking, you know, 26 years ago. He was not particularly receptive to that. If anything, I think he derided me. In an audience of about 100 people, nobody said anything in support of me. So I don't know if you're familiar, uh, Gail, with a famous study by Solomon Ash, the social psychologist, in which he had students, there were eight students, of which seven were stooges. They were in on the, on the study. And he'd have people, there were two lines, A and B, and you'd say, which line is longer? And some of them it's very obvious. And so the students would say B, 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 and they get to the eighth guy who's the only actual subject in the experiment, and he'd say B. Then the lines get closer, so it's not quite so obvious. But clearly, let's say now A is a little bit longer. So these seven guys all say B is longer. So now you got the eighth guy, and his eyes are telling him that it's the different from what the other seven have said. And so he's in a bad spot. So what happened? I can't remember the exact results, but some people caved. But can you imagine? You, you're you seeing something, but everybody else, the social, the whole milieu is telling you, no, it's this way. That's how I felt. As if, am I crazy? But I wasn't crazy. The politics had already, little did I know, started to intrude political correctness on the data on what the actual data was showing. And equity didn't mean let's help boys if they need help. It meant then, as I think it still means today, let's make it better for girls and women, even if boys are struggling. I don't think maybe there's been some slight change, but the culture is still focused on how can we make things better for girls and women. Women, I think there's some very legitimate issues, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Cross Cross-culturally, around the world, except sub-Saharan Africa, more women graduate from university, and I think now more women go to grad school. Oh, so absolutely. So that's, that's just a fact. Oh, it's absolutely true. And in fact, women outnumber men in the U.S. in college by a considerable margin. It's been that way for a while. It used to be more men, and then around 77, 78, the two graphs crossed. So you had men here, 
It went like from that, there's been such a big decrease in the number of men, the percentages, that was percentages. And then the women's percentage went like this. Now, master's programs, PhD programs. So they are outnumbering men in all of this. So and why why is that? What's What happened with the men? I don't know for sure the whys of it. I think, but here's what I think. I mean, this is, uh, you know, everything's so complex. And your field is sociology or psychology? Or My PhD is in religious studies, and I taught in sociology and women's studies. Okay, so or, okay, so you're, you're, you know that these things, none of this fits well into disciplines. You know, it's, and everything's complicated. But here's what I think, one of the things that happened. I think... All the attention to women and the encouragement, girls, girls and young women, the encouragement that they got. For example, take our daughters to work day, which began around 93, 94. Um, and my question was, what do you mean take our, what about the boys? They're not thinking necessarily they can do anything. A few years later, it was take our daughters and sons to work. So a few years later, it was changed. But back in the day, it was like, take, okay. There was the focus, girls, don't feel they can do STEM things so well. Let's encourage them. Let's make sure girls know that they can do really well in STEM. The message that girls were getting and are still getting is you can do anything you want. But still, they're a big minority in, in STEM fields. They are. They are. And why that is is a question. You know, I think in, in Sweden, I, again, I don't have the data in front of me, which is about as gender open as any place you can find. Apparently, the disparity in terms of going to STEM is even greater because apparently women left to their own devices, at least in Sweden, aren't necessarily so likely to go into STEM. You know, a simple way to say it is, and all of this, Gail, is statistical. None of it applies to everyone. There are women who are brilliant in STEM. They're going to do great in it. Overall, women seem to be more interested in relationship people stuff than in object stuff. Yeah, they go psychology. into biology and life sciences rather oh, than physics. Oh, psychology, biology too, I think, you see lots of women. Yeah. Physics, math, engineering, not as many. That's changing. I mean, I have a friend who went, two friends, these two friends I'm talking about, went to Cooper Union in New York, great place, small place. When they were going back in the 60s, they graduated as I did in 63 from college, there was almost no women in their programs, very small programs. Now, one of my friends tells me it's 40% female. So things are definitely changing. But here's the thing that I think is so depressing. I feel it's depressing. The place where boys struggle a lot, and particularly boys of color, which I don't think should be ignored. I think as much as boys in general may be struggling, black boys, Latino boys, they are really struggling. And not that the girls are doing fine, but the girls are doing quite a bit better. College enrollments, those differences are bigger for minority communities than they are for the white community. One of the problems for boys is reading and writing, language skills, which is crucially important. There's, I don't think anything more vital than being able to read at a reasonable level and being able to write in a way that's grammatical and clear. That's where boys are really lagging behind girls. And has there been any major program saying, like there was for STEM, let's help our boys read? No. Will there be? I strongly believe there will. But it's not here yet. They, they used to say that, and this was said for a long time, that primary school favored girls because they had better fine muscle motor coordination and they can mm -hmm. sit still longer. Yes. It's harder for boys. They're more kinesthetic learners. I think there might be something to that, and I think there are people who have written books, again, they don't get the attention I wish they get, on so-called boy-friendly classrooms. There's someone, I think her name is um, King, I can't remember her first name now, K-I-N-G, but again, I've, I've had so many books and read so many things, it's hard to yeah, right. But there have been books, I think her book might have been called Writing the Playbook, about schools can be more boy-friendly. And there's someone named Michael Gurian, who I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He does great stuff. He believes in gender differences in, in learning, which is kind of controversial. But he he is very into, he, he, he cares deeply about girls, too. He has two daughters. Um, but he talks about classrooms not being set up necessarily so well for boys. 
uh, recess, from what I've heard, in some schools has been curtailed to a large degree. And having some activity is, is important for both boys and girls, but statistically probably even more vital for boys. Not what letting them have that chance to run around. What I do with my grandson, I have a big exercise ball. And so mm -hmm. when he's doing schoolwork, he's on the ball, like I'm on a ball, moving around and great. wiggling. <laughs> so that That's really great. helps him. That's great. No, yeah. I think I think it's a question of what makes for better learning in boys. And from what I have heard, again, I, have, I remember once speaking to someone years ago, because I've been involved in this so long, who said it turns out that so-called girl-friendly classrooms, and there was a lot of that when that work was started in the 90s, boys may struggle with it. The reading is not anything they're particularly interested in, for example. Um, it's not their type of stuff that they'd like to read. But boy-friendly classrooms, that girls do okay in that too, that they, and it may not be fair, but I think girls are more likely to feel comfortable doing boy stuff than boys are comfortable doing girl stuff. And a boy who wants to do girl stuff, more power to him, that's fantastic. But a lot of boys are not so into that. The tomboy is a familiar figure. Often she's quite successful. The boy who hangs out with the girls, he may do great. I, he may very well do great. But he, he may not. And, and the fact is, for example, with reading, I would sneak books into school. I love to read even at an early age. And whatever we were reading in school, we're talking now the late 1940s <laughs> into the early 50s, goes back that far. Um, let's say, yeah, late 40s into early 50s. I was reading these adventure books. So in class, they were reading, I don't know, Paul and Betty, all this stuff. I would have the books under my desk reading a book. In other words, I was this, you know, I, I was this hidden reader. I was, you know, it wasn't drugs or anything. It was like my book. I'm reading my book. And, and then I think book reading lists, a lot of it has to be about emotional stuff. Some boys are just not into that. They'd rather read adventure things. Um, there's something that boys love, at least my two of my grandsons, I think, have loved it. Captain Underpants, mm. which is this sort of graphic, these graphic stories that are very silly. And the boys love it. But I think some people say, oh, that's that's not cool. I mean, it's just it's child stuff. It's just but what the kids little, like now is Percy Jackson has a series of novels about Greek gods. Oh, OK. And it's it's all about power. You know, who has power, magical powers, this kind of okay. power. That's, That's what they great. talk about. That's great. I know that, you know, one of my sons, I think they all like to read, but one of my sons in particular, one of my grandsons, of course, I should mean, who is, um, he's very much into reading and he likes adventure stuff and he does and he likes stuff that's kind of fantastical and he loves reading that stuff. Um, and what he gets to school, I don't know. Again, I'm not, I'm not right, right there. Um, but I think the classroom could be made to allow for a little more activity for boys to have stuff that they're more interested in. And uh, here's an example too, maybe this is changing. When boys write, they often write stuff, at least I did, and, and I think a lot of boys do, which is adventurous and perhaps a little violent. This is writing. I was never a violent kid, ever. But this was writing. And it was fine. I, you know, I don't remember ever getting into trouble for that. Well, I've read things that boys now, if they write something because there is this occasional school shooting or something, horrible though it may be, thank God, exceptionally rare, and these are usually boys with some real issues, it's almost like, oh, you can't write, you can't write that. But, but what are you doing? Our little fantasy world, I mean, if a boy writes something, he's like, I'd like to bomb the school. Okay, now you maybe it's time to have someone you know, check in on this kid. But if he's writing a, a war story, I used to write, it was, I'm in elementary school, World War II ended in 1945. I'm in elementary school starting, I think, in 48 or 49. The war is still fresh. And I would write, I would do these little cartoons of battles with tanks and everything. Today, if a teacher saw that, and I'm a, I'm a boy. I, who knows what might happen? I might get into, I might, my parents might get a call. Hmm. But it was, this was okay. What, what, you're on the President's Commission on Boys and Men. Is that the right title? And what do you, 
What Wait are the a minute. Goals? No, no. There's uh, something called the White House Council for Boys and Men. It's, there's no official council. It's a group that Warren Farrell started, um, which has been advocating for years now for a White House Council on Boys and Men. And, and I think it started when President Obama, in 2009, within a few months of taking office, started the White House Council for Women and Girls. And Warren, very much into all these things. I think he was invited because he was well known in feminist circles. He was invited to get involved. And he said, well, I think we should have something for boys and men. And apparently it didn't go anywhere. And but he stuck with it and he's sticking with it. And uh, so he's that's that's what I'm on. Yeah. Um, Obama did start a group for young men. I think young men of color yes. after his his term. But what what are the goals for this this council that with your I think it would be to start to have a, a council devoted to, to issues around boys and men, having a central sort of place. The latest thing I think, I know there's interest in this, President Obama, uh, President, I'm sorry, President Biden, <laughs> former vice president, <laughs> you know, he's under Obama. President Biden, even before he took office really, but certainly once he was in office, it was an executive order establishing a White House Gender Policy Council, it's called. Now that term, gender policy, implies gender includes men. Unfortunately, nothing in this executive order says a word about boys and men, hmm. nothing. It's about girls and women. And there's concern with this White House Council group, and I'm personally concerned that this is, is lacking. This is not good. That um, we have to be concerned about boys and men as well. And I think that's the main thing this group is interested in. What what are other issues besides um, education? What about violence, um, being well, incarcerated? What are other okay, issues? Well, as I've written about, I've written a lot of stuff in psychology today about this stuff. Um, violence, yeah, men commit it more often. The women don't, it's not like they never do, but they're far more often the victims of it. Um, incarceration, the gap in gender is huge. It's particularly terrible as you know, for, for men of color, whose incarceration numbers are horrible. And again, it's primarily males. And that's what seems to be, I would say in a way overlooked. The, the race part is looked at, and I think that is vitally important. But another part is the gender part. And so you have suicides. Do girls attempt more often? Yes. They're starting to unfortunately do it more often too, successfully. I hate that word successfully about a suicide. But over the years, across the all ages, but late, you know, for years now, among younger males and females, the rates for young males is way higher than for young women. Addiction and it's and it's post fatal overdoses, higher among boys and men. On almost every negative thing you can look at, you find more boys and men. And it needs attention. It absolutely needs attention. How we solve it, I don't know. But to have a, a council by the president that doesn't even mention these things that I can see, I think is a, gr a glaring omission. The, the issue is it's some, like, you know, testosterone base that makes men more violent, or is it that they see violence in the media and they're socially conditioned. And if, if we do the nature or nurture, it would be interesting to look at other countries. So if, yes. if it's nurture, then are there examples of other countries where they, boys don't have these kind of problems? I'm unfor unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the, with the global kind of thing, but I think it's a combination of both nature and nurture. And again, all statistical. Um, I, you know, watching two of my two brother my two uh, pairs of grandsons who, who are, you know, they, they're, except for the only child, they're about the same age difference, about three and a half years. And first, the older ones of, the, of these two pairs, they're just fighting, you know, with each other, the way brothers often do, to the point when we were taking care of them for a couple of nights, I don't, I don't yell at, I don't want to yell at kids. I found myself yelling because I just, <laughs> you guys have got to stop it. Uh, so your grandsons were fighting, and they—they they just often would, you know, fight the way boys brothers do. Although I've heard they're 
fathers or sisters, they, they fight. So it's not strictly... I fought with my brother. I had a younger brother. We fought. There you go. So it's not strictly gender. But brothers very often, it's really... So they were, they would go at it. And now they're older. You know, they're 11 and 14. So they're, and the 14 year old is very big. So they, they, can't, they can't do that anymore. But my other, my youngest son and his wife, they would watch these two guys in California fighting and they thought, oh man, they, their parents are, you know, they can't control them or something. Then they get two of their own, <laughs> the same age difference. And they are telling me how individually each one is great. Get them together and that's it. So I get a, I get a kick out of it because it's, um, and again, it's not strictly a sex difference, but I think I've watched at restaurants and places like that where you see a couple of brothers often really going at sometimes sisters too, two sisters, but not as, as often, it's not as vigorous. They, um, they've they done studies that primates, like our chimp cousins, the young males do more rough and tumble play. Yeah, so yeah, I think the, that's true. There's different play differences. Oh, and, yeah. and I think what's interesting is that fathers, human fathers do more rough and tumble rough housing with even with babies so the babies get excited when the dad comes in the room and they get kind of comforted by the mom so there's different play styles right right i think warren farrell has definitely talked about that he, he's very interested in that the rough housing uh which he thinks is yes yeah, there's a lot to it and um yeah i think that is something and i think but you know your your original question about nature and nurture i don't know the world situation but i think to be honest with you I think it's some of both. I think, and this is tough. Again, girls girls are not what they were when I was a kid. So they're pretty adventurous now. I sometimes have somebody behind me driving on my, on, right in the back of my car, really following me too close. And I still try to drive at a good speed. I try not to be one of these guys, you know, oh, look at this old guy. I, I keep, but it used to be, it was a guy. It would always be a guy. Now it can be a young woman. And it's like, you know, that said, I think boys and young men are still more adventurous in kind of a scary way. I think they are more likely to take real risks. And yeah, and they're more likely to die from jumping off bridges and cliffs. Yeah, and, and that's frightening. That's frightening. In other words, uh, my kids are all grown now, but um, my grandsons aren't. And they are, two of them are teenagers. And it's frightening because you... You know, I remember, uh, you know, I think, oh, wow, I'm this really good driver. I remember sort of drag racing somebody on a, on the Long Island Expressway down at the, one end of it was just still under construction, you know, <laughs> and I'm going along and there's this pickup truck and I looked down at my speedometer, I'm going 95 or 90 or 95 and I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? And yet at the same time, I thought, why do car insurance companies have me pay more insurance as an under 25 driver? But that was me who I think is a pretty cautious guy. But, but I was, uh, you know, 18, 19 years old. And it's, if I could do that, uh, that's frightening. But if you're a parent, that's a rough time. That's a rough time, mm. you know? And, uh, and, you know, you hand the kid the car keys, girls can be a problem with that too, but, oh my God. <laughs> you know, the other interesting thing to me is that female primate and human female maybe they're just as aggressive or more indirect like the boy will punch someone and the girl will say teacher you better punish so and so so it, it's aggressive but just more indirect so i've heard again without daughters or granddaughters i have not seen that directly but from what i've heard girls can be very hurtful to each other in ways that don't necessarily involve physical aggression but rather three girls where one of them is now kept on the outside and that can be very painful boys just to stereotype a little bit a couple of boys may wind up having a fight and one punches the other one and they have this fight and then they're done and they 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 each respect each other and now they they not necessarily become best of friends but they could become friends yeah no that's true i and the word that teens use is drama mm, there's a lot of drama talk and that's like Who's likes who and who doesn't like who and who's going out with who and who it's all this relationship drama. Girls do a lot of that from my observation. Oh, yeah. In fact, one of the findings in the work I did so many years ago on male female communication, what from what you know, young women talk about women in general, young women, was they would talk a lot about family, for example, more than the more than the guys would. And they would talk about you know, boys would tend to talk about 
girls, but they wouldn't necessarily talk about other boys so much. Whereas girls, I think, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I could be getting this wrong so many years ago, girls would talk about both boys and and girls. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, the drama thing. Now, do you teach, you You still teach at college? No, I, like, I'm no, done. Okay. But I, yeah, I taught women's studies. Okay. So maybe you, you maybe done it more recently than me and watched young people in, in the, you know, on the campus. And I guess it's been years for me. I mean, I still live nearby, but I don't, I'm not there very much. What, what about men's organizations? So there's men's rights groups, there's mythopoetic, there's pro-feminist like nomas what what's the scene currently in terms of men's activist groups well i'm not exactly super familiar with it i know the groups i associate with are just concerned about the well-being of boys and men like the white house council group uh, there's another group called the global initiative for boys and men there's a guy named sean Coleman, k-u-l-l-m-a-n he's very involved with that he's someone i've known for a long time um quite a few years, not a long, long time, but some years now. Um, there is also, I'm on something, an advisory group with something called the, the uh, Boys Initiative, which is just concerned about how boys are doing. Um, and the person who's the executive director is a woman named Vermel Green, V-E-R-M-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Last name is Green, G-R-E-E-N-E. -E -E. uh, there's also a division in the American Psychological Association I've had some, you know, some involvement with, which is Division 51, which I think is called the, I forget what the exact title of it is, but the Society for the Psychological Study of Men and Masculinities. They are very much interested in the different ways men can be. They're very much, I think they're quite pro-feminist, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, they're an interesting group. Uh, then the men's, so-called men's rights, they, I think, to some degree, maybe not, not appropriately, but they get a pretty bad rap. And I think part of it is some of the stuff they do really does seem to be, I hate to say, border on misogyny. Maybe, and that that doesn't make women all that happy. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a very interesting film called The Red Pill by, um, God, how could, trouble with names here. But if you look up The Red Pill, uh, and you'll see the, uh, Cassie, Cassie J, C-A-S-S-I-E, J-A-Y-E. Very interesting film. And Cassie, a young woman, she's now, I think, in her early 30s, and this film is from a few years ago. She wanted to do a hit job on the men's rights groups. <laughs> she was, you know, feminist. She, she started talking to them. She talked to Warren, who knows all these groups. He's not a member specifically of men's rights group, but he's certainly very knowledgeable. And, and she said, wait a minute, they're making some really important points. They're talking about child custody, where they definitely want to be involved as fathers, and and it was very, uh, hold on one second, I'm going to make sure that isn't my, my wife. No, it's not. Okay, hold on one second, I'll close this door. Anyway, um, so she just found they had a lot, there was a lot of stuff that bothered them that really were an issue. For example, one of the things that isn't paid much attention, domestic violence is terrible, and men can do very harmful and... Um, Destructive. Wait, I'm you, I'm seeing you in a little frame as well as. Uh, let's see if I X you out here. I don't think this will X you out totally. Hopefully it won't. No, it did. Okay. Um, and there's, you know, violence that can be, you know, deadly. But women do commit acts of domestic violence against male partners with a great frequency, and it, you would not even think it ever happened if you were to look at the mainstream, and yet it does. And I know personally. Personally, that's just me. Several men who have been victimized by that. Deadly, no. Injury, yes. And and it's like ignored. And so the, I think the men's rights groups and other pro-men groups say, we can't ignore this. It's happening. Um, and it's it's unfortunate because it's, it's, it's bad either way. People should not be violent to each other. Um, so stuff like that. Uh, but again, the groups differ, I think, a lot in how, I don't know, there's some that sadly don't, I don't think they speak about women in a way that I, I'm comfortable with. Although some of what they say, you know, it's really something, Gal, I see this over and over again. We end up throwing out the baby with the bathwater because there are a lot of groups that are not, a lot of what they say I'm not good with, but then they'll have some little nuggets that are 
yeah, that's true. So they're saying some things that are, I do agree with. It. And so it's distressing when they go a little too far. The left does the same thing. I mean, I, you know, extremes. I like people who are kind of somewhere in the middle-ish area and say, you know, this way over here or this way over here, it's not, it's not working. It's, it's getting people so angry and, and I don't think it's so helpful. So. What about men's studies academic journals? There's like maybe three of them or something? What, the what only you... one I'm familiar with is the one published by the American Psychological Association, Division 51, which I think is called something like the Psychology of Men and Masculinities. Again, I don't have the exact title in front of me, but if you look up APA journals and then put in Men and Masculinities, you'll, you'll find it. And when you look at those journals, what are themes? What, what are they concerned I don't know. Again, I don't read the academic literature so much. I was an academic for years. I, I've written a humor column. I wrote a humor column for many years. I, I've kind of, I think maybe just somewhat retired from it. But I wrote something once about academic writing, which I made fun of. Good. And I, in fact, in one part in the, in the piece, I said, I wrote some quote. And I said, it was something I did on psychology of language. I said, I had this little quote, and I said, do you understand this? I said, I don't, and I wrote it. <laughs> I wrote it in the 70s, and here in the thousands, to the aughts, I didn't even understand what, it was, what I was saying. So these journals, I don't, they're a little too, too much for me, but I think a lot of it is the effects of culture, the effects of cultural conditioning, and I think a lot of it is talking about trying to help men be, for want of a better term, better men. Um, just to to treat women more respectfully, to not feel they have to be macho. Um, I don't like the term toxic masculinity. I think that's too often used as a general term about men. But it is true that men often indulge in behaviors that can be harmful to themselves and others. And I think this, you know, these this journal does really try to look at that. Um, and uh, you know, so that's important. You wrote an article called Third Gender Men about men in academia. And yes. what, I, that's interesting to me because what I always thought is a lot of academic men were wimps in nerds in high school and weren't like the college football people yes. who were popular. And so yes. the way they make up for it is they monologue and take turns talking in meetings, but it's about being heard and being you know, having publications and whatever, making up for this high school uh, sadness. <laughs> what do you think about that? It could be. I think when I wrote that, again, that was quite a while ago, and it was one of my early pieces that I put republished re in Psychology Today, though I'd written some years before. Um, I was just talking about, I think, academic men. Well, I think what I said was the third gender. It wasn't about trans transgender stuff. It was about there are men... There are women and there are academic men. <laughs> and I meant that as an academic man myself, I there were certain sort of manly qualities that I, and I was making fun of it, that I didn't have, okay? And um, I referred, as I recall, to uh, someone in, in Texas named Kinky Friedman, and he had some band, I think, called Kinky Friedman and the Texas Jew Boys. He was Jewish himself. I think he's still alive. Quite a character. And I thought, well, that was kind of, a real man. I think one of the things I said in that piece, I can't remember because I've written so many pieces, that I sometimes looked at people, guys who were quite accomplished, and I thought, well, they may be famous for the creative work and maybe in a way that I'm not, but I have a PhD and they don't. And then one day I thought, maybe that's why they're so accomplished. They didn't bother going through all this stuff with graduate school and the PhD. They just did their thing. You know, <laughs> Kinky Friedman, probably smart enough to get a PhD guy's very smart, but he just thought, I'm doing my music, and I'm going to have myself a time here. Um, and so that's, I think, part of what, what I was saying. And I also remember meeting my middle son, father-in-law-to-be. I mean, at the time, we were just meeting his then-girlfriend, and they weren't engaged yet. And now they've been married for, it'll be 20 years, so I'm very happy about that. So I'm meeting him for the first time. And he's from Florida. And he's a business person. He had a, a wonderful diner, calling I mean, a wonderful restaurant. Now he's expanded to about six or seven of them in Florida. And he's this big guy. And I'm, he's about three or four inches taller than me to start with. And he just seems like a real man, so to speak. And I remember 
I felt like this little kid. And, and he's, you know, I'm respectable. I understand that. But that's what I kind of, I think, was getting at by the third gender. I was just, I just enjoy making fun of the stuff, often at my own expense, which I think is some of the best humor. If you're, if you're making fun of yourself, you're not going to, you're not going to alienate other people. So I enjoyed that. But, um, well, but do you agree that a lot of academic men were not the popular people in high school? I wonder about that. I think that's probably true. If, unless they had other things going for them, I think if you were an athlete, if you were I, a musician, I'll tell you, as soon as I started playing guitar, which I really didn't get into until I was finishing up college, um, I always liked music and I used to plunk around on the piano. I picked up a guitar and I started playing and I noticed, you know, girls seemed <laughs> a lot more interested. Um, had I been doing that in high school, it would have been maybe a different story. But I don't think the academic stuff turned girls on at all back then. Later, my father used to say to me, because he knew how I was not happy about this. He'd say to me, hang in there, Mark. They'll come around. And he was right, but it took a while. So because in those back in that time, I think the girls, I've I written about all this stuff, and mostly humorously. The girls were interested in, in the big guys, the jocks, tall, good looking. I was not great looking. I was not very tall. I was skinny. Um, and it, it was like that counted for so much back then. And so I didn't feel so good about myself. Um, years went by, I felt better because that stuff, and intelligence and possibility of success. Again, at, at that age, that was not a turn on to 16, 17 year old girls and maybe more so now. And, and so it was difficult. It was very difficult for me. Um, and I think probably a lot of guys who went into academics, um, but there was once a, an article and I think it was in, um, a women's magazine, what mag I can't remember a well-known women's magazine. And I probably, I a saver, but I probably eventually threw it out. And it was, I think a cover story, the sensuous professor, what's behind his magnetic appeal. I remember thinking, aha, because <laughs> I, I didn't realize that once you're a, a, a college teacher, now you're about 28, 29, here are these young women, um, I'm married, so you know, like, what am I gonna do? But it was like, you really sense like, you know, I, I'm up here in front of the group, I had a good sense of humor. Uh, now my time has come. It's a late <laughs> day, but. <laughs> so what, I think that's what did what you write in How to Attract Women that's got a lot of hits from your PT articles? Oh yeah, that was fun. That was, um, but I was making fun of things, and yet I think it's gotten a lot of hits. And it also I did it as a podcast. It was my first podcast episode. I have a podcast also called The Fetching Professor. If you Google it, I'm the only Fetching Professor, the only one that you will find in Googling. I'm sure there are many. Um, you know what Fetching means, right? Complaining. So yeah. It's a great yeah. Yiddish, great Yiddish. Yiddish word. Yeah. But anyway, um, I wrote that in good fun, but I think people seeing the title. Just thought, oh, this is going to help me. So it became a, a hit, and it keeps it's an evergreen. But I think some of the things I said did make sense. They did, you know, like like not um, not trying to use classic lines that the, these women have always heard before. Trying to not just saying hello, rather than saying hello, beautiful, you know, things like that. So there was in the humor. I think there were some things that maybe were true. And at the end, I said. Something about if I was just joking, but I think there was something to it too. That if you think these days uh, women are attracted to guys who are highly successful, whatever, no, the key thing is they want someone who can, let's see, do the housework, such and such, and most of all, vacuum. That's what they're looking for, or something like that. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I can't remember. Again, I wrote it quite a few years ago, and I don't keep reading it. I just know it, it sort of got popular, uh, which is nice when something does. What, what attracted your wife to you? What Did you vacuum for her? <laughs> no, 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 no. Back at first in those days, guys weren't doing that so much. No, I don't know. I Oh, oh. in fact, that can get to the next thing. In fact, we've been going for quite a while. I think, you know, I, I you said something about marriage. So maybe that's a good lead-in, if you, if you don't mind. That would be fine with me. That, that was my lead-in. Yes. Yeah, I think it was, um, I was divorced. I had a child. So in those days... You know, I was already divorced with a kid by the end of 1966. I met my wife 
I think in 67, we started going out in 68. I was a graduate student. She was working for a professor, um, smart, uh, funny, um, and we would have lunch together. We became friends. <clears throat> and then I thought, nah, maybe it'd be nice to, we can start a relationship. And we did. And I think she really kind of liked me. I, I'm not quite sure what it was, but I know she she was a little, to start with, I think a little, I think she didn't admit, agree to this, a little more interested in me than I was in her. But I began to realize um, I had, a, you know, we had dating between, after my first marriage was over, um, which was not a long marriage. And sometimes these, these women were, they were attractive, but from my point of view, they would have their point of view. They were pieces of work, so to speak. They were, I just was, I'd be very excited. And then there was one in particular who I really was crazy about. It would be really difficult. And then she called me at two in the morning and say, oh, I'm sorry. If I, and I just was a slave to, you talk about drama, a slave to that drama. In Shelley, there was no drama. She was consistent. She didn't let me down one day and then was there the next. She was consistent and good. We found it very easy to talk to each other right from the start. She has a terrific sense of humor. She turns out to be a terrific writer, a wonderful editor. When I do stuff, nothing almost ever leaves my, my computer without her editing it first. Very, if she likes something, that's it. It's like, okay, we're gold. Um, and it was just a, a just, uh, just kind of got, I don't know. There was, I think, again, I think she liked me to start with. And then I really, you know, got crazy about her. And, um, you know, and it was, I feel very, very lucky. And she's just a, a good human being, has lots of friends, people. She's not a therapist. She could have been. They call her constantly. She's such a good person to, to talk to. And if she ever went into a PhD program in psychology, I think she could get 30, a full year of credit for just living with me. <laughs> what, what have been the challenges over 50, 30, 50 years? I 50 mean, years. there's got to be some. Oh, yeah. No, I was, um, you know, back in the day, I, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details, but, you know, pot was very popular. It was illegal then. Now it's legal. Um, I haven't touched anything in, in decades, but I probably smoked too much. So I was, you know, not exactly, my behavior could be kind of up and down. Um, and it was just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge in, in marriage. We, you know, I, I was a father already of a son. Um, and then we had kids of our own and that's a challenging time, but it's difficult. Financially, we were okay. We weren't, it wasn't great when you're young, you you know, our parents we knew would, would help us if necessary, and it wasn't like we were poor. I'm not gonna ever can't say that, but it was. Um, it's just hard. It's hard. Um, but we we definitely knew we you know we had the strength. Um, but it was, you know, we we have never been never once for a day we've been separated. And in fact, I think I could say I never once have even slept on the couch. And I think for a 50 year marriage, that's saying something. <laughs> so so w what? What did you use if there were disagreements like over the kids or money or whatever? How did you resolve them? How do you resolve them? I think we, first of all, we're really to a large degree on the same page. And let me say a couple of things. I was looking at something I'd written about this. That I think maybe we'll address this. I think a key thing, you know, I've written things about what's the most important things. I think probably in a way the most important thing is to choose wisely, so to speak. In other words, I had a first marriage. My first wife is a wonderful woman. She is. We were just not meant for each other. I, I was very difficult. I was way too young to get married. We, we had this child early on. And it, it was not going to last. It was just clear it was not going to last. Second time around, um, you know, she was wonderful. We just, you know, and again, I still know her well. She just lost her second husband. I'm really sorry about it. They were married over 50 years. And, and uh, she met him a couple of years after us. Um, and they got married a little before me and Shelly. Um, we get along great. You know, we have the son that we both adore. And, and okay. But with Shelly, I knew I wanted someone I could talk to easily. Um, someone who, because I could be difficult, would kind of stand up to it, which she did. She would, you know, strong woman. You know, Shelly's incredible. Strong, independent woman. Um, has trouble with some of the way left-wing feminism. She just doesn't like the victim thing which you sometimes see. She doesn't like that. 
Um, but that was good for me. I needed that. I needed someone who would confront me if I needed to be confronted. Um, so I, it was a good choice, uh, I think, you know, for, for me, especially, and for her, because I'm, I'm okay, and I've gotten better over the years. Um, but I think with the children, I think we were really to a large degree on the same page. And if, oh, here's something. If we did have a disagreement about the kids, my recollection is from an early age, we would not do it in front of them. Children will really try to form an alliance with the parent that seems to be on their side. So as I recall, and again, our youngest kid is now 40 years old, so it's been a while. But I recall that we would do whatever disagreements we had and iron them out so that we presented a united front. I think that's really important. But again, we were, to a large degree, a kind of an agreement about our children. I mean, we didn't, I don't remember any major issues about, well, I think he should be doing this, or I think she's, that's no she's in my, in my kids, I think he should be doing that. Uh, no, we, to a large degree, we were, I think we were in agreement, but we had iron out differences. How often was your first son with you? Did he go back and forth, mom's house, dad's Not house? Not enough. He went back and forth, but I've, that's been, um, you know, a sadness for me that I wasn't involved enough with him. I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't realize, keep in mind we got divorced before it was, quote, fashionable. There were not these books that were out. Um, my wife remarried. Um, she had him call her new husband dad, which I think in retrospect probably was not the wisest thing because I was his dad. She, he could have called, her by, called him by his first name. They had two more kids. But I, I don't want to say anything negative about her. I think she did, on the whole, a great job as a mom. But I was not involved enough. My son, he saw that I was more involved with the ones who, in my second marriage, who I watched being born back when he was born in 64. They didn't even allow dads in the delivery room. So whatever bonding could take place right from that first moment, I think it, maybe it's oversimplifying that, but it's a big moment. Very exciting to see your child born. I saw that twice. With him, he was already a couple hours old. Um, it's still a big deal, but okay. And I wasn't involved enough. He confronted me on that at about the age of 30, first in emails, then on the phone, saying, you know, Dad, you weren't involved enough. And, and that really... And we went through some rough times with that. And But I would say, again, you work on things with your family. I know all kinds of estrangements in families. I do. I know siblings who won't talk to each other. I know fathers. I know one guy who I love who has his daughters essentially have nothing to do with him. Why? I don't know. He's, he says he doesn't know either. I don't know. If, I don't think there was any kind of abuse. Going. He was married a couple of times after that marriage to their mom. I never wanted that to happen. And with my oldest son, we had problems where he would sometimes be quite down on me. But we both worked very hard at it. And I never say, I'm never smug. <laughs> but we've been in a very good place for a while. And uh, but, but I do look back regretfully that I wasn't more inclusive of him when he was growing up. So all we have is now. Yes, right. How do you and Shelley keep things alive, passionate, interesting, after so many years, 50 years is a long time. It is, it is. No, I'm very happy about it. I think we just enjoy each other's company. We, we make each other laugh. We, I, I also enjoy our discussions. I get pretty passionate about things. She isn't what I call a hardcore feminist, but she's a woman and she, <laughs> certain areas we better leave alone. I learn eventually, like if we're talking about what happened with President Clinton and Monica Lewinsky and once upon a time we were talking about it actively because that was what was going on. I don't think what he did was great, but I kind of get it a little more than she gets it because I'm a guy and I'm not saying I think, oh, that was great what he did, but it's like, Here's this young woman, she's all over him. He's the president, but he's, and women all love him anyway, but okay. And so he I, thinks so it's not really intercourse, so it's not as bad exactly, as if you It wasn't you really had, sex. It was, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Oh yeah, right, exactly. No, 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 it, that's a tough one. But we, on the whole, really, I think, uh, see things in a very similar way. But she's a very interesting person, very smart, very well read. Um, Passion, look, I think any couple, when you, you're older, it's not the, the passions of a 
of a youth, which leads me, by the way, to one of the things I suggest to anybody contemplating marriage. Um, passion is great. Sexual passion is fantastic. If that's all you got going for you, and you don't have much to talk about, and you don't get each other to laugh, it might work. I'm not saying it won't work, but it's taken a little bit more of a risk. Because I guarantee you, you are not going to feel at 65 the way you were feeling at 25 or 30 or 35. It's just not the same. And there better be some some other stuff. That's that's, And that's important even early on. I mean, I think, you know, even when you're young and having sex a lot, you not it's not 24 hours a day you're going to be talking <laughs> right and uh so uh i think that's really really important do you you know there's a song by captain and Tennille, love will keep us together mm. old pop song great song and it's it won't it's great but there better be there better be some other stuff going on that you you enjoy being with each other you enjoy your conversations you enjoy and and one great thing about a long marriage I think this is wonderful, is we can look back and talk about the 19, the late 1960s because we were both there and we were together, not married until 1970, but we, we, were, we remember things going decades back and, and there's a beauty to that that I, I think is wonderful. To have a history. Mm. Um, last question is, are you optimistic when you think about like Biden has replaced Trump and maybe you'll get this counsel? Are you, or are you pessimistic when you think about the possibility of real equality? Real equality in what sense? Between boys and girls, men and women. Yeah, that's a tough question, uh, Gail, because I, unfortunately, having been interested in this for so many years and not having seen any major change, and again, really focusing <clears throat> on younger people, because I think the issues for women, um, while things have changed dramatically since I was young, with law school, for example, where I remember women at Harvard, a Harvard undergraduate, smart as hell, wondering if she could get into law school, because she was a woman, 1968. Now, half and half. I mean, so things have changed, but I think, I think women legitimately still have things where they feel it's, they haven't arrived yet. Girls and young women, I think they're, there's a different kind of feeling where I think a lot of boys and young men maybe don't feel that they're being recognized. Let's say I'm cautiously optimistic. I try to be, because otherwise I wouldn't keep doing this. I think there are lots of great people working on this. And I think, here's what makes me feel maybe there's some hope. I think one day the true strength of, of our society over the next five whatever years will be the people who are not absolutely pulled to the extreme sides. Mm. There are people, there's someone named Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, he wrote a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. But even before that, he talked about bias in the academy because their conservative views are not welcomed at all. He started out, I think, quite the act liberal. I think now he's more middle of the road because he says we've got to be open the, the truth, in fact, Cassie J, in a wonderful TEDx presentation she gives, which has about 8 million views, the one into that film, I think her last line is, or somewhere in this wonderful video, says something like, the truth, it's next to the last line, I think, the truth is in the middle. Hmm. And the middle doesn't excite people the way the extremes do, hmm. but I think she's right. I think we are... The, the truths about us as as human beings is not these extreme things we keep hearing. I think it's it's and there are some people who are there. And well, I Biden to seems to be like in the middle. He does. I, I I like him a lot. I don't. I wish he was a little more open to the issues for for boys and and men. I do, and and that saddens me. But again, <clears throat> you take what you. You know, President Trump, because of his behavior, and I'm not even talking about his politics, I'm talking about his behavior, the way he talked about women, the way he, he very likely treated them. He did, I think he hurt men so much more than he helped us. Because I think feminism, which was kind of a little bit, I wouldn't say the doldrums, but oh my God, look, 
the, the Women's March on Washington, that was the day after inauguration. They didn't, there was no time wasted. Yeah, it was they the biggest was march difficult. ever, I think. Pardon? I think it was the biggest march ever. In it was unbelievable. This man, again, I, politically I wasn't crazy about him either, put it mildly. That was, because, but he doesn't represent men. He doesn't represent men the way I see men. I think men, there's tremendous decency in most men. Right. I really believe that. But why did he get 70 million votes? Why do people love that's, him? That's a tough one, but I think it's partly because I think people at the lower end of things or the middle end of things, I think white people particularly, although I'm, I, I can't, I know how it feels to be black, but my, I, I talk enough to black people and, and get enough of the internet to know that life for a black person, the fact that a black man that I may know and respect and care about deeply walking down the street and hearing a cop car is going to have a different, he is going to have a gut reaction that I won't have. And there's something horrible about that. And, and until that, somehow we can deal with that and change it, we're going to struggle. That said, I think white guys, young white guys, not the elite people, they feel nobody's, that the Democrats have, have forgotten them. I think, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. They feel disenfranchised. Not just, you know, they, they feel like, well, nobody cares about me. The, the, the Democrats aren't even noticing me. So I think that's part of it. This is like the high school educated blue collar worker, white guy. Yep. yep. I think, I think a lot of votes come out of that. I think a lot of votes come out of that. And, and um, it's, it's distressing. I think the Democrats, to be honest with you, when Hillary Clinton was running in 2016, I tried, so did Warren. We talked to people involved with her campaign um, who were pretty high up in the campaign and said, can't Hillary just once say, she could say, I'm a feminist. You all know I'm a feminist. But you know, our boys are struggling too. And we, we have to pay some attention to them. She never said it. And to be honest with you, Gail, I think had she said that, someone like me who voted for her, I would have sent money. I would have maybe gotten involved because I would have said, wow, she she didn't do it. And, and Biden isn't doing it. And I think somebody's, I really think the... The Democrat who recognizes the needs of men and boys, the Democrats are already doing well. I think then then it'll take off because they, I think we should have a balanced government, by the way. I think a one-party system is not going to be good <laughs> at all. But that has to be noticed. I think that has to be noticed. I think When, when you talk to the Biden administration about this council, what do they say? Do they say no or they say we're working on it? or We're we thinking haven't, I don't think we've had so much direct contact at this point. So... So it's, um, <clears throat> I, I don't know, we haven't gotten much in the way of response, but Warren's reached out and it's a certain reluctance at the moment. We'll see, we keep working on it and there are different groups working on it. Um, you know, so uh, can I say one more thing about marriage because I had it in my notes and then, then I'll be done. I know we've been on a long time. Oh I've no, loved, it's great, I love it. I loved it. Um, I, you know, we've married a long time and one of the things we do is we try to, you know, do some things just behavioral. And here's something I'm gonna suggest to any married couple or any couple. Hetero, gay, doesn't matter. I think when a question is asked of a partner, very often, even if it's said with apparent innocence, it's a loaded question. So for example, if you say about something on a counter, why is this here? You don't just mean, why is this here? You mean, this shouldn't be here, but you're not saying it that. You're saying, why is this here? So Shelley and I have developed something we call the point of information question. Like in parliamentary proceedings, the point of information, you just wanna know. You have to respect it. You can't do it for something where you really have, a, you know, some ulterior motive. You really have a feeling. For example, point of information. Where would you like to have dinner tonight? Back when we were going out to dinner. Point of information. I'm curious why this is. But you literally are just curious. And if you say point of information, other person relaxes. You ask your question, but you can't abuse it. You can't mean it. So it's worked very well for us. Something as simple as that. <laughs> That's a good tip. Yeah, I would recommend that. Can't, I'm just can't trying lose. to think what it, it makes the person be analytical. It makes them kind of go into left brain and think about why is this canister here? It puts some right. distance on something. But it's also relaxes them because if you, 
a lot of questions, I think, are almost automatically loaded questions. Mm -hmm. How come you did such and such? But when you say it with genuine, I think there's no substitute in keeping a relationship going to have genuine curiosity. Mm. Literally wondering whether it's how your spouse feels about something, non-defensive, uh, openly non-judgmental. I think, you know, one of my sons, I don't want to say which one, but because I love them all so much. One of my sons particularly is like that. He could ask someone a question that the rest of us would be pussyfooting around. He would just ask it because he was genuinely curious and it was clear to people. He was not judging. He literally was wondering. People, I think you get all kinds of great responses when you do that. Can you say something like, why are you wearing that Unusually... One second. Oh, wait, I'm getting a phone call. I just want to make sure. No, it's not. It's not. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What, what, what if you're wearing this really ugly sweater? And mm -hmm. I think, why would he wear something so ugly? Can I say, point of information, why are you wearing that sweater? Or is that loaded? No, that wouldn't. No, see, that would be going against the spirit of it because you really do have an opinion. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so I think when you start asking the why, a why question... It could be a point of information question, but it's a little less likely than some other questions. But no, it has to be, I mean, a lot of questions you're not going to do that because you do have a concern and you, you know, I'm not crazy about that shirt, whatever it is. But the point of information, it's, it's amazing how the person relaxes. And as long as you don't abuse it, it works pretty well. Great. I'll include that. Anything else that we haven't talked about that you want to make a point about men, boys, relationships? No, God, I, you've been on so, so long. I really appreciate it. No, I just think I would just like to see our country, the government, the media, um, the academy, just recognize that for males, especially the young, younger males, um, they are suffering and we have to start paying attention to them. That, in the, as Warren often points out, we're all in the same boat. Um, I, find, I don't think there's a woman or a girl around that doesn't have some male that they love. And if that male is suffering and not doing well, um, that's going to hurt her as well. It's not as if we live in isolated communities. Men are here, women are here. And, and I think the well-being of boys and men is crucial to the well-being of society. And until our government, you know, Michael Gurian talks about this, the government, the media, uh, the academy has to begin to open itself up more to looking at these issues involving boys and men. It's the way some people put it, it's not either or, it's both and. I really believe that's true. Yeah, I really hope that we can get there. It's my what, fervent hope. What's a Michael Gurian book that you like? There's one called Saving Our Sons. There's another one, I can't remember the exact title, he wrote it with a woman who's since died, um, something about... Boys in Education. If you look up Michael Gurian, G-U-R-I-A-N, if you look him up, if you go into Amazon, you'll just see a whole bunch of things. And the Saving Our Sons is a, a recent one. He's he's wonderful. He's uh, he's just great. I okay. mean, a uh, very respectable guy, as is, as is Warren Farrell. I mean, there are people who really care and, and are doing tremendous amounts of work. Yeah, so. I'm going to interview Warren um, next month. Um, Fantastic. Before I let you go, I, I want to include young men in this book because... They're the future leaders, obviously. So I'd like you to think about young men thinking about these roles that you'd like to see included. Okay, well, do you want me to, I'm not going to say anyone now, do you want me to think of some people you might, yeah, you might get? Yeah, whenever. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. And if I forget, just remind me. Okay. No. Right. <laughs> I hate to do that. That's always, I wrote a column once called Stress Shift. When you say, <clears throat> remind me, you're putting the stress on the other person. <laughs> Well, that's okay. But does anybody come to mind right now? Um, I'm not thinking. I'm thinking of one person in particular, um, but I don't know as well. I'm thinking of someone who's a lot younger than me, but he's in his 50s, so he's not young, young, but he's fairly young. Um, I um, Let me think about it. That yeah. might be difficult. I wouldn't want to get, obviously, my sons are younger. My youngest is 40, but I don't, I just try to keep them out of this. They, 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 I'm not going to use them as my involved, you know, they have their lives. Um, but uh, I'll see if anyone comes to mind. Okay, great. All right. All right. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you. This was a real treat. I really enjoyed it. It's fun well, to meet I you. I did.
I liked it very much. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, you were a great interviewer, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> me too. Thanks. Right, you take care. You too. Bye. Bye. <laughs>